My name's Dave Donnelly. I'm the dean of the uh, graduate school, and I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, College in New Rochelle. Uh, and I'm, I've got the honor to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, Ken Doka, Dr. Ken Doka is an exemplary faculty member on several levels. Uh, he's a respected teacher, uh, but he's also provided outstanding service both to the school and the college, but also to his profession. And he's also made significant contributions to his discipline as well by questioning and building upon the existing body of knowledge. And quality research always has some sort of practical application. And when we're talking about a universal experience like grief, uh, this research is especially valuable. Uh, Dr. Doka is a professor of gerontology in the graduate school where he teaches in our master's program as well as our advanced certificate in thanatology. He's also an ordained Lutheran minister a senior consultant to the Hosp Hospice Foundation of America, a licensed mental health counselor, and an internationally recognized expert in grief. Uh, Ken is also a uh, prolific author, and he's published uh, 100, more than 100 articles and book chapters, and he's the editor of both Omega, which is the Journal of Death and Dying, and Journeys, a newsletter to help in bereavement. Dr. Dokas just completed his uh, 35th book, just published the 35th uh, book, Grief is a Journey, Finding Your Path Through Loss. After the talk, we'll have copies of the book, um, and you can talk with Ken in person after the talk. Um, this is uh, Dr. Dokas' first book for the layperson, so it is, uh, it's, it's especially accessible, if you will. It's hard to quantify the, the impact of all of this work. I, I think either directly or indirectly, Dr. Doka has helped uh, countless individuals confronting loss. Uh, tonight, Dr. Doka will speak on the topic of growing and grief. Uh, Dr. Doka. Thank you very much. I want to thank so many people who were involved in this. Lenora Carpinelli, Dean Donnelly, and the College of New Rochelle for sponsoring this event. I also want to thank uh, Yona Des Desholmes. Did I pronounce that right, Yona? Okay. And Le Leslie Meredith, my editor, and Atrium Publications, a, div a, a division of Simon & Schuster. And I really want to thank my clients and my students because so much of your, your work and so much of the work we did together is, finds its way in this book. And of course, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here tonight, many of which are my students. I don't see any clients, and, and if and we have a deal that we never identify each other anyway, so I, I, I couldn't tell you if we did. So thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's interesting, you know, one of the questions comes up really, what is grief? And, and the first thing we want to say about grief is really, and this is a point we try to make very strongly, grief is not about death. Grief is a reaction to loss. Whenever we experience a loss, we experience grief. It's always interesting, you know, uh, Freud, when he wrote articles, used to always start with a case study. Um, and of course his famous article, which really begins the scientific study of grief, is Mourning and Melancholia. Um, and in that article he starts with a case study. Anybody want to guess, and my students better guess, uh, what that case study is? It, it's a bride abandoned at the altar. And I think Freud was, was giving a lesson, it took us a long time to learn, that grief really is not about death, but it's about the myriad of losses we experience in our lives. Um, and, and again, it's very individual. We each grieve in our own way. We grieve in our own way for lots of reasons. Our relationships are different. Uh, you know, who died and our relationship with that person. The circumstances of the death are different. Some people die after a long illness. Some people die suddenly. And it's not that one is easier than the other. It's just that they are different from one another. The support we have varies, both in terms of who we are and in terms of what we can draw upon. Um, our health is different at different points in our life. And when we're not healthy, it's harder to deal with the stress of grief. 
and we come from different cultures and spiritualities. All of that make our experience of grief very, very differently. And it affects us in different ways. How many of you have ever experienced grief on a very physical level? It just hurts. Lots of us, right? A number of years ago, uh, I had a colleague, Jane Nichols. Uh, and Jane Nichols was a pioneer in the area of perinatal loss. Uh, she was really one of the people who changed how we dealt with perinatal loss. She died a number of years ago. But if you remember in the 1970s when she did her research, there was no support for people who had miscarriages or stillbirths. You know, if you got any support at all, it was somebody saying, you're young, you're healthy, go get pregnant again. And Jane was one of the pioneers who first began to document the grief process that people went through. And she studied uh, people who had had miscarriages and stillbirths. And again, at a time that their grief wasn't validated, at a time when nobody said, what are you feeling? Because, you know, you shouldn't be feeling anything. You hadn't had this child in the, in the minds of many professionals. She found that most people had physical complaints. You want to guess what the major sources of those physical complaints were? Stomach, uterus, number three. Heart, breast, number two. Head, number one. Number, number, number four, I'm sorry. The first one was pain in the upper arms. And it makes sense when you hear the name of her article, the empty arm syndrome. These are the muscles you would use to hold and lift a baby. This is where, you know, they were, they were painful because they were empty. You don't even have to go there, really. Um, how many of you have ever been at sleepaway camp as a counselor, as a nurse, as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> Who sees the homesick kids first? It's the nurse. And the kids aren't saying they're homesick. They're saying, my tummy hurts. They're saying, my legs hurt. So we experience grief physically. We also experience it emotionally in all kinds of emotions. What are some of the emotions you've experienced in grief? Loneliness. Loneliness sadness. Anger. anger. Big one. Frustration. Frustration. Isolation. 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 Guilt. guilt. Yeah, I was just going to say guilt. You know, all these range, and sometimes positive emotions. And what I mean by that is uh, sometimes relief when somebody has suffered for a long time. Uh, and sometimes we feel guilty about feeling that. <laughs> and sometimes you can even have a positive emotion. You know, when somebody dies, you can, you know, I've, had, I've done studies of caregivers. And caregivers will often have this sense of satisfaction. Yeah. I never thought I could do this for as long as I did it. I never could be there as, as much as I was. We experience grief cognitively in the ways that we think. How many of you, when you were grieving, ever went downstairs? Uh, to get something, and when you got downstairs, you forgot what you went downstairs to get. I once was talking to a group of widows and widowers, and one of the persons said, more than usual. <laughs> and I guess the answer is, yeah, whatever your threshold is, it's more than usual. It affects the ways we behave. It affects us spiritually. And again, years ago when we first started in the field, we used to look for universal stages. Remember the old Kubler-Ross model? But yeah, now we look for the personal pathways. We look for the very individual ways that we grieve. We no longer look for those you know, large, large models. And, and we recognize that people grieve in different ways. One of, some of the research that I've done with my colleague at Hood College, uh, Terry Martin, is uh, we started working on gender and grief. Do men grieve differently than women? Well, the answer we found is some do and some don't. <laughs> so we began to talk about styles of grieving. Uh, we began to talk about a continuum of grief. And you'll find men and women at different ends of this continuum. So for instance, the intuitive pattern of grief on one end of the continuum is a pattern in which um, when you ask a person in that pattern how they experience grief, they'll often talk about waves of affect. I felt loneliness. I felt anger. I felt guilt. I felt sadness. When you often ask them how, how they're going to express it, how they express their grief, they'll, they'll, it'll mirror those feelings. I cried, I shouted, I screamed. And when you say what helps to people on this end of the continuum, they'll say, you know, I, um, it helped me to talk to a counselor. It helped me to be in a grief group. I needed to sort out my feelings.
Now on the other end of the continuum are what we call instrumental grievers. Instrumental grievers, when they talk about their experience of grief, will often say, I thought about this, I felt somebody hit me. Uh, when you ask them how they express it, it's often talking about the person, sharing memories, sharing reflections. When we did this book, I had a moment where uh, I was 50 years old when we first did this. Um, and uh, I was on a ski trip and I, I fell off a lift and broke my right arm. And I realized two things uh, when I broke my right arm. I realized that sometimes people say the dumbest things to you in crisis. <laughs> Always a good lesson for counselors to remember. Uh, true story, I'm, I'm lying there on the ground, my arm's broken, I knew my arm was broken. And the ski patrol comes over um, and the first thing he said, um, you know, when, when, I, when we realized my arm was broken, um, is he, um, he asked the question, was this your last run? <laughs> and and I, it's exactly what I said. I looked at him and I said, it is now, yes. Did you want my lift ticket? <laughs> Humor's a coping device in my family. And, um, and he got a little embarrassed and when I said that, and he said, he actually said this, he said, it is my hypothesis that these accidents happen on your last run. <laughs> I had to respect that. Um, I said, a fellow researcher. Uh, I said, let me give you an alternate hypothesis. When it happens, it's your last run. <laughs> the second thing I learned was how instrumental I was. Because when I fell and I broke my arm, I began to ruminate about that. Oh, this is lousy. This is going to screw up my year. This is miserable. And I did that for about 30 seconds. And then a voice came out of my recesses of my mind and said, this isn't helping, is it? And I went into a problem solving mode. And I called my partner, Kathy, who was not skiing. I was skiing with, my, uh, with the younger godson and his friend. And I said, Kathy, almost in these, this tone of voice, I said, because I get very linear when I get, uh, when I get stressed. I said, Kathy, I said, I just broke my arm. I need you to do three things. <laughs> she had the car. I said, I need you to pick up the kids at 4.30. They don't know I broke my arm. So they'll be waiting for, for me and waiting for you. I said, second of all, send Keith in to get my skis into the infirmary. He knows where that is. And then third, pick me up at the hospital. Now, Kathy's very intuitive, so she's crying <laughs> on the other end. You know, um, and, and she looks and, and she blurts out, I don't know how to get to the hospital. I calmly reminded her there are two major roads in Vermont. It's on the intersection of both of them. It will not be hard to find. We still argue about that because evidently I wasn't empathic to her pain. Uh, so, you know, so the difference is. But that's instrumental grievers. They, they, you know, they grieve in this more cognitive way. Um, they do things somewhat differently. And again, you know, as you grieve in a family, it's important to recognize that we sometimes have different grieving styles. And those styles aren't measures of how much we love a person. You know, I once dealt with a couple where the wife was very distraught about her daughter's death. And she was also distraught that the husband's way of dealing with it was to set up a scholarship fund for the daughter. And his attention was focused on that. But that was his way of continuing a bond. That was his way of remembering. We grieve differently. And grief is a roller coaster. You know, uh, we have ups and downs, we have highs and lows. It's a dual process. We're, we're dealing with two things. We're dealing with, dealing with the loss and coping with the loss, and at the same time trying to build a life in the face of that loss. And we oscillate, we go between those two things. And we have good days and bad days. Again, some are predictable, some aren't. Uh, sometimes we know the birthday is going to be difficult, or the holiday is going to be difficult, or Mother's Day is going to be difficult, or Father's Day is going to be difficult. And sometimes we, we're just torn by surprise. Uh, one of my students told an incident um, where she said, uh, you know, I had a client come in as she was recounting her incident to the internship class. And she said, you know, I said, how are you doing today? And she said, you know, it's funny. When I walked to the car, you know, when I woke up this morning, I was really feeling good because I was going to see you, and, and you always give me a lift. And she said, when I got in the car, all of a sudden I plunged. 
And they spent the whole session saying, but why did you plunge? And she couldn't figure it out. And then she called the student later on the next day, and she said, when I got home that night, I figured out what had happened. Said, when I got home, I got hit with the smell of blooming lilacs. And she said, the lilacs reminded you of your mother? And she laughed. And she said, my mother used to drive me crazy. She would buy this cheap perfume in Woolworths. It used to come in big quart bottles of lilac scented perfume. I still remember those purple bottles. She said, and every, you know, every birthday or Mother's Day or holiday, I'd get her some exquisite and expensive perfume, and I'd smell it for the next time, and then she'd be back to the lilacs. And, uh, and she said, when I smelled the lilacs, without even realizing it, it brought up all kinds of memories about my mom. But the question that we're going to focus on tonight is however painful grief is, and it is painful, and it is difficult, and it can be long, can it be an impetus to growth? And let me tell you a story. Um, I always like what a colleague of mine says, we have no choice about loss, we have no choice about grief, but we do have choices within grief. Any of you ever gone caving? Any spelunkers in the crowd? Just a couple. OK, uh, yeah, a few. OK. Well, if you ever go spelunking or caving, uh, and I did the simplest kind, which is horizontal caving, caves are made by water flowing through limestone. So they're wet and they're muddy. Uh, this is a picture of my godson, uh, Scott, one of my godchildren, Scott. Uh, you can see he's very clean. It was just taken at the very beginning of the trip. By the end of the trip, he was totally wet and caked in mud to his chest. Uh, he's the only one I could ever get caving. My son would never be interested in caving. Uh, he, was, um, he works on Wall Street now. So if you said, even at 10 years old, Mike, you want to go caving, his response was, what can we buy or sell there? Uh, you know, <laughs> what are Guiana futures going for to these days? Um, but I got Scott there. And, and we reached a point in this cave up around Albany, his first caving trip. Uh, and, and here we are, we're, you know, we're, um, we're going through this, this stream as we're going to the main, you know, main cavern of the cave. It's a small cave. Sometimes we're crawling. Sometimes we're almost slithering. Uh, you've been there. You know, you know it. It's um, wet and dirty. Wet and dirty. <laughs> We'll have a sign-up sheet later on for those of you who want to make the trip. Um, but in any case, um, and then we get to an end of the cave, Ward's Gregory up by Albany, and at the end of the cave is a place called the Pinch. And it looks like it's just a pond now that goes to the end of the cave. But what you have to do is you actually have to go underwater and go through a three feet channel that's totally submerged you know, holding arms, and then you get to the other side of the cave. So naturally, this 10-year-old boy was a little bit nervous about that. So I said, well, we can go back the way we came in, and he thought an hour and a half, you know, crawling and slithering, or finally he sort of swallowed hard, and he said, let's just do it. And so we went with the rest of the caving club, and we went through it. And, and you know, when it was done, um, I said to Scott, I'm really proud of you. You know, that was great. That was tremendous. And Scott was feeling very good about himself. And he said, yeah, it's one of those things my dad always talks about. And I, you know, I, his dad's a very good friend of mine. But I, I didn't understand exactly what he was saying. And I said, what does your dad say? And he said, my dad says there are choices in life. And sometimes the choice is to grow up or grow down. Wow. That's a power in that. And, and I think grief can be one of those choices. We really do have a choice. It's the only choice we have in grief. Whether it's going to destroy us, whether we're going to grow up or grow down. And sometimes for people, loss can be a transforming event. It's going to be transforming one way or another. Life is never going to be the same on the other side of loss. The question is, what it kind of life is it going to be? Is it going to be a life that's diminished? or a life that's enhanced. 
Catherine Sanders made that choice. You know, I, in, Celt in, in Celtic mythology, thin places are, are boundaries. Grief is one of those places. Let me tell you a little bit about Catherine Sanders. Catherine Sanders was a colleague of mine. Uh, Catherine Sanders uh, used to joke about the fact, now we can show our age here. Uh, we come from a variety of ages. How many of you ever remember that Cold War drama, I Led Three Lives? Few of us, okay. Uh, this was a person who led three lives. He was uh, a normal businessman. He was a member of the Communist Party, and he was an FBI agent. Probably like most members of the Communist Party at that time. <laughs> um, and um, and so he, you know, so it was a, it was a you know, kind of a Cold War drama in the 50s. Well, Catherine Sanders would always joke about the fact that she led three lives. Uh, she was a high fashion model in her early life. And even as she aged, you could still see that, you know, uh, that structure. And then she fell in love with a dashing Coast Guard captain by the name of Herschel Sanders. And she married him. And she became a military wife. And she started to go back to college, as she said, to keep a step ahead of her kids as an adult. And then one Labor Day, when her son Jimmy was 15 years old, she was watching him as, of course, you know, living on a Coast Guard base. He was a commander now. They would, you know, they would, all the kids were always involved in water sports. And she was watching a 15-year-old son water ski. And all of a sudden, a boat crossed his tow line. He slammed into the boat and was killed instantly, as Catherine Sanders literally watched on shore. And you could see the devastation. And after a while, she decided to go back into college. And she decided she was going to study grief. And in the late 1960s, mid-1960s, that took about an afternoon. Because there wasn't a lot of research there. And so what Catherine did is she decided to do some of that research. And she became you know, a specialist in grief, did some of the early research in grief. And she said, often people go through what, and she found this through her research, certain phases. The first phase is shock. You know, you just don't expect the death. And even when somebody dies in a hospital, I always like what a colleague of mine, Therese Rando, says. Therese Rando says, people die suddenly. Most people die suddenly. And then she'll add, in the midst of chronic illness. In other words, we know they're dying, we know they're ill, but we don't often expect them to die just at the time they did. And anyway, so then they go through what she called an awareness of loss. And this awareness of loss is where the pain is intense, the grief is intense. And then they go into a third phase. And she had an instrument to measure it. She called it the grief experience inventory. It's now known as the Sanders grief experience inventory that she called conservation and withdrawal. And she said to the outside world, this person looks like they're doing OK. To the outside world, this person is functioning again. But if you ask that person, scores are lower than they were before. They're not in as much pain. But it's more chronic. And, and what happens here is people will say, I spend all my energy just getting through the day. You know, it, you know, yeah, I'm going back to work. I'm doing what needs to be done. But that takes all that I have. There's nothing left. And she said, in that phase, people ultimately have three choices. Some people will die. And we, you know, we do talk about the broken heart syndrome, where for lots of reasons, people you know, die. The stress of grief. They stop taking care of themselves. Um, others just maintain the status quo. Um, they just, you know, they, they, they just want to stay there. A number of years ago, I was counseling a woman whose best friend her, and her, her the person she literally lived with was her sibling, her sister. Two, you know, two adult women who lived together, sisters, and, and they were life for each other. Uh, they were both professionals. They both would travel together. Uh, and her sister died suddenly um, uh, from a, you know, a blood clot. And, um, and she went into counseling with me. And then one day she said, you know, when my sister died, when my sister was alive, it was watching color TV. And it was like all of a sudden when she died, it was like somebody pulled out the plug. And she said, what you've been able to do is put it back in, but now it's just black and white. 
And I said, we can get the color back. And her response was, to do so would be a betrayal of my sister. So she was willing to live this life, compromised life, because to, you know, to go back to the same level of enjoyment she had would seem to be to be a betrayal of that relationship. We, we never got past that. And she terminated therapy. But that's somebody who maintains the status quo. But others, and this was one of the things that was unique about Sanders' work, others will make the decision to change. Uh, you know, Sanders called that the turning point. Uh, often it was an explicit moment when they decided, no, they did want the color back. They did want to live. Sanders has a number of great examples, but one of my favorites in her work is uh, um, um, an older woman whose adult daughter lives close by and her granddaughter lives close by. Her husband had died some six years before. She has a five-year-old granddaughter. Every time she sees the granddaughter, she cries because her husband never got a chance to, to experience this child. And one day, as she hears her granddaughter talk to her mother after they left the house, she hears them through an open window. And the little girl says, Mommy, does grandma, is that all grandma does? Does she just cry? And, and the, the mother told Sanders, I didn't want to be known as the grandmother who always cried. So she made the decision to change. I didn't want that to be my memory of her, the granddaughter who always changed. And so she did a, a, a fifth step, you know, then people go into what she called renewal. They, they get the color back. And then years later, Catherine approached me, we were good friends, and she said, I'd like to do an article with you. Because I think there's a sixth phase. And Catherine Sanders' life was a good example of that. She said, I think there's a sixth phase that I would call fulfillment. And she said, um, and she said I, I, I got a letter from somebody that really made me think about this. Because you know, the people she studied would often write her. Now, Sanders at this point had become a beloved expert in the field of grief. She actually had the first psychological radio sto uh, show in Charlotte you know, where she lived. Um, and she has a letter from NBC TV uh, from a person who wrote her who said, you have, you know, she had this lovely southern charming voice, you know, with that, that uh, you know, tilt of an accent. And, and she said, um, this guy said, every day I would listen to you on the radio, give advice. And I always would fantasize about you. And he said, what I would fantasize is here's this psychologist who sounds so together. He said, what if she's just leading a crazy life and she only pulls it together for the radio? <laughs> and she said, I kept developing that as an idea for a TV series. And she said, I finally pitched it at NBC. Um, and he said, they all turned and said, that's a great vehicle for Frasier. He said, you were Frasier. <laughs> so Catherine Sanders had this very rich, full life. Uh, and she framed that letter. Uh, as, as a testament. And, 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 you know, and so she resonated with this letter she got from this guy. And this guy said, you know, when I was listening in church the other day, the pastor told a fascinating sermon. And the sermon was that this guy goes to this, like Iran, where they're making these beautiful Persian, uh, you know, rugs, these, these beautiful Asian rugs uh, with the intricate designs. And he sees this guy, old guy, standing up on a scaffolding. And he's got binoculars. And he keeps giving messages to these young apprentices who keep running up and down to the people who are sewing. And he finally says, what is that guy doing up there? And the guy says, oh, that's the master carpet maker. And whenever he sees an error in the carpet, he incorporates it into the pattern. And Catherine says, I think that's what a lot of grievers do. They, you know, they, they develop, uh, you know, that this was, an, you know, this was a horrible event, but somehow they re reweave their lives around that event. So we, we wrote that piece together. You know, and, and we know that. Grief has a mysterious math. Some people are diminished by grief. Some people are, are, are destroyed by grief but some people grow with grief. You know, and look at some of the changes. This is some of the work that we, we know now. Some people have a greater appreciation of life, of relationships. It means more to them. Their character grows. They say, I'm stronger than I ever thought I could be. Maybe they have a greater existential awareness. 
you know, the fragility of life. Um, you know, one of the things that I, we always did in my house is we never go to bed angry. <laughs> You know, and I remember one time when my son was about 10 years old and, and I was leaving on a trip and he was kind of Yancey and I said, come on, Michael, let's get going, we gotta move. Uh, and he said, I hope the I'm gonna miss the plane. And he said, I hope the plane crashes. You know, 10 year old, angry 10 year old. So I, I sat down and I laughed and I said, let's talk about it. I said, because if anything happens to the plane, we'll spend ye you'll spend years in therapy. <laughs> and, and, and he laughed at that and, and we moved on. Growth in skills, changes in lifestyle, uh, you know, and, and renewed spirituality. I love this cartoon, this complex equation on the board. You probably can't read this well, but the teacher says, there, Skylar, do you understand it now? And Skylar says, no, but I'm confused on a much higher level. <laughs> I think that's where my spirituality is. Uh, you know, I, I've realized I don't know all the answers, um, but I know a lot of good questions. So how can we help grow in grief? And I think the first thing is, is, is that old Janus mask. You know, we have to look forwards and we have to look backwards. And looking backwards, we have to say, what did we really lose? What did that relationship mean to me? What did that person mean to me? What did even that possession mean to me? Why am I grieving this? Um, and then I think we have to ask, what is left? And I think this is one of the new understandings of grief. You know, we used to say with Freud that we, we get closure. We move on. I always say, bring closure to the term closure. There's no such thing as closure in grief. The people we love stay with us. They're part of our memories. Those always exist. They're part of our biography. Uh, you know, if you knew my parents, you could see my mother in me, and you can see my father in me. They're, they're part of who I am. We have those spiritual connections, whatever we believe them to be. You know, we'll reunite again, how, however we, we look at that in our own spirituality. Um, we have our, our legacies and liabilities. Um, one of the things I do every day, uh, and I'm sort of infamous among this with my students, right, you're all laughing, is I make a color-coded list yeah. of things I have to do. And you know, today was a good day, you can see most of it's crossed off. Um, but I make a color-coded list of things I have to do. My father made a list. My son makes a list. My grandson doesn't, but he loves colors, he's 13 years old, we have hopes. Uh, <laughs> You know, so uh, you have this. And then the extraordinary experiences that are part of this. You know, how many of you, and I'm just going to ask for hands at the end of this, when somebody you love has died, have had maybe a sense of that person's presence? You know, just kind of, or maybe a sense experience where you smell a smell associated with that person, or dreams very, very common or symbolic experiences. Lou Legrand was one of the first people to write about this, and what cued him to this was one of his clients came in one day, and she said, I had the most remarkable experience. Her young son had, her 17-year-old son had died. And he said, what was that? And she said, well, you know, when I come to your office, I always stop past the cemetery where my son is buried, and I always stop there. And when I went to his grave, there was a hawk. And the hawk was perched on the grave. And the hawk kind of you know, turned his head and looked at me. And then the hawk flew away slowly. And he said to, Lou Grand said to this woman, and that's reminiscent. And she said, my son's nickname was Hawk. <laughs> you know, those kinds of symbolic experiences. Um, or third party experiences where somebody says something that almost seems like a message from the person who died. How many of you, in the course of one of your bereavements at some point in your life, have ever had one of those experiences? Yeah, most people have. Most people have. Another form of connection. And then the legacy's left. This is a Native American proverb. When you were born, you cried, and the world rejoiced. Live your life in a manner that when you die, the world cries, and you rejoice. You know, the legacies we leave. And our own resilience. 
you know, that's part of the, what, what we have too. The internal strengths that we experience. How does our loss speak to us? How does our spirituality speak to us? A lesson from Winnie the Pooh. If there is tomorrow when we're not together, there is something you always must remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But the most important thing is even if we're apart, I'll always be with you. We learn some wisdom from Winnie, don't we? You know, uh, and then this is another saying. What the caterpillar perceives is the end to the butterfly is just the beginning. Uh, how our spirituality speaks to us. Now, some of you may not grow as much because you've already experienced a sense of resilience. And resilience can be a pattern. This is some of the newest work from George Bonanno at Columbia. And Bonanno talks about the fact that some people have a comparatively limited reaction to loss. And it's important to talk about that too. Because sometimes people go to these conferences and think, what's wrong with me? When the answer is, nothing's wrong with you. You're doing well. Uh, part is situational. Resilient grievers have had fewer losses or other stress. They've had a chance to say goodbye. They have an intrinsic spirituality. And loss is considered a challenge. And they have an optimistic mindset. And they believe that even in the worst things, they can learn and grow. I know you can't read that cartoon. It's two fishermen being swallowed. It's a group of fishermen being swallowed by a large fish, <laughs> drifting down the gullet. And two of them are clearly horrified. And one says, well, well think about this. You got to admit, us being swallowed by a fish has its humorous aspects. <laughs> You know, a belief that even in the worst things, you can learn and you can grow. It engenders positive memories. And again, you know, both have in common, again, this is a guy who's fishing and there's a rescue boat coming. And he says, no, the, 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 I've never had fish like this before, uh, you know, in the midst of a flood. Both have in common the ability to create something out of a negative experience. In resilience, this happens just naturally in transformation and growth, it happens after a struggle. But we can grow in grief. And we also have to look at our external strengths. You know, the people around you, your friends and your family, your intimate network. And one of the things that I've learned over time is that sometimes we don't use our network well. If you were my client and you came to me in the midst of grief and I knew you had a support system, some people may not because they've outlived it, one of the first tasks I'd give you as an assignment is I'd make you list all the people on your support system. That'd be homework, just so you know if you ever come to me. And you'd come in with this list of people. And then I'd say, OK, there's one other piece that we have to do here. And that other piece is I want you to look at that list. And I want you to put a D next to all the people who are good doers. You need something done, these are people who will do it. These are people you can count on. Um, you know, I, I have a good neighbor like that. If I'm leaving for a while to go on a trip, I can just email him and say, would you bring in my mail? I don't have to do that more than once. And I know that when I come home, sitting on my table in a plastic bag is going to be a week's worth of mail. Done. Right? L is for good listeners. People who you can call at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they'll be honored that you call. Probably many people in this room are good L's, right? Well, maybe not up to 11, maybe, uh, at least. Uh, but good L's. Uh, Jim, by the way, my neighbor who's a good D is a terrible L. Uh, and, and, you know, and some, a lot of people can't do. You know, they, they have one fuck. And then the R stands for respite people. Grief is hard work. And sometimes, like any piece of hard work, you need time off from it. And these are the people you can go out with, you can laugh, you can watch a movie, go to dinner, and they're never going to turn to you in the midst of it and say, how are you really doing? Because they hope against hope that you don't talk about it. Because <laughs> they don't want to go there. But that's their gift. Their gift is to give you space. Their gift is to give you respite. 
And again, you know, one of the things that's really nice now about grieving now compared to the past is there is so much more support available. Counseling, self-help groups, um, you know, all kinds of books. I like to think my book is one, but all kinds of books out there. And ritual. Oh, oh, I didn't read the cartoon. Oh, I'm going the other way around. Oh, the cartoon is, um, sorry, no water. We're just a support group. <laughs> but there are support groups, and they do a lot for us. And then sometimes we can create rituals. And again, you know, in our own lives, as we deal with various pieces of loss, there may be times, I mean, the funeral ritual is valuable. Uh, however we do it and however we do it as a memorial service. But beyond that, we may have to mark places in our journey during grief. Um, you know, rituals of continuity are just rituals to, uh, to continue the bond. We have a family ritual where we decorate the Christmas tree. And the first three ornaments we put on are memorial ornaments to my parents, to my son's grandparents, and to a godson's uh, father who died. And it's a way of saying, we can talk about these people. They're part of our holiday. Another ritual is a ritual of transition. And a ritual of transition is a ritual that, that marks steps in the journey of grief. And a number of years ago, uh, I had a client who came to me. And I said, what brings you here? And she says, I want to take off my wedding ring. Um, my husband died about five years ago. She was a middle-aged widow. She said, I want to take off my wedding ring, but I j just can't seem to do it. Whenever I do it, I get tearful, I get cry. And I said, well, tell me about the ring. And she said, well, here's the situation. She said, you know, she was Catholic, and she put the ring on in Catholic ceremony, and she believed it was for life. And it was for life. And she said, when I was taking care of my husband in his illness, and he was, you know, a strong man who, as she said, didn't do sick well. Um, she says every day, uh, it was tough, you know, and, and that's the dirty secret about being a caregiver. It's tough to be a caregiver, but it's also tough to be taken care of. No adult really wants somebody else changing their, their, their pants and, you know, and, and helping them bathroom and all that kind of stuff. So she said every day it was tough. We'd end up arguing, we'd end up fighting. Said, but when we went to bed every night, we put our hands together so our rings touched, and we repeat our wedding vows in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. It says it gave us the strength to get through the day. So we created a ritual to take off the ring. And we went back to the church she was married in, and the priest called her up after the masses on Sunday in front of her family and friends and said, were you faithful in sickness and health, past tense? And she could affirm in the presence of her family and her friends that she was. And he said, may I have the ring, please? And she said, the ring came off as if by magic. And what she did is she had both rings attached. The priest took care to have both rings attached to each other and welded to the frame of a wedding picture. That vow was now complete. And then we have rituals of reconciliation that are just rituals to say, I'm sorry. And sometimes rituals of affirmation that simply say thank you. And we may need those at various points in our journeys through grief. And then finally, we need to look forward. Catherine Sanders used to say, I ask people three questions as they terminate therapy. What do I want to, and she starts out by saying, you're going into a life that's now changed. What do I want to take from my old life into my new life? What do I want to leave behind? Maybe some of the anger. And what do I want to add? What are the skills or the new abilities, the growths that I need to experience? You know, one of the things I sometimes do with my clients as a self-help is say, the first question I always ask is, how has your story changed from your last visit? What's different? And I think it begins to make us focus. It's not a bad exercise if you're coping with loss to ask yourself that question. How has my story changed? And I'll tell you one other exercise that I do. When people, when I have a support group, and when people leave that support group, one of the things I ask them is, today is April 19th, 2016. 
okay, this is the last day of our group. I meet you in the supermarket, April 19th, 2017. And I say, I haven't seen you in a year. What's going on? How are you going to respond to me? And I've had everything from, I'd like you to meet my new spouse, <laughs> to sometimes a little bit has changed. But it, it, it reminds us that yes, grief is tough, grief is difficult, you know, uh, it's the price we pay for love, ultimately. Uh, you know, I always say if you want to know how not to grieve, never fall in love with anything, never get attached to anything. Grief is the cost of love. But even in that cost, we can still grow. Thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you so much for being a part of it.